Good evening, everyone. This is our, our third in this uh, series of Women Who Stay. And so welcome. Um, before I introduce our guest this evening, I just want to remind you all, and you probably saw email, that next Monday to conclude this series, we are going to have a hybrid meeting uh, where we will gather both in person, and for those of you who wish, you may zoom in and participate online. So Ashley um, is asking that people respond so we know how many we'll have in person and how many people want to participate on Zoom. But the focus of that time together will be one, just being together since we haven't been together since um, early 2020 or somewhere in there. So it would be nice just to, to be able to see people and have conversation with one another in person. Um, and we also want to reflect on kind of where we've been since we started this initiative, um, particularly with um, the presenters, the women of the Bible as well, and kind of what is lingering for us. So you might want to be thinking about that. And then we'll, we'll look ahead to where, you know, where next, or do we continue what we're doing? Do we add some new elements um, in person, remain Zoom, a combination, all of these kinds of questions that we want to um, put before you. So we will look forward to um, seeing you next Monday, either in person or on Zoom. Where, where will it be in, in the uh, church? Is it in McKenna, actually? I have both McKenna and Trinity booked because I wasn't sure about the numbers. So um, as soon as we have our tech plan and the space figured out, I will send a, an email to all the registrants. OK. So with that, um, it, it really is an honor to introduce our this evening, Sister Mary Foreman, um, who unfortunately I never was able to have for class when I was at St. John's. I so wish that I could have because I hear so many wonderful things about your, your teaching and from Mary Schaefer as well. So welcome Sister Mary Foreman to our virtual Women Who Stay series at Holy Trinity. Uh, Sister Mary Foreman is joining us from Cottonwood, Idaho, uh, where she is prioress of the St. Gertrude's Monastery. She is a professor of monastic studies. She taught at St. John's University in Collegeville, Minnesota. Um, the author of books and articles on, um, in the area of monasticism. This evening, she's going to share with us insights about many of the, the women from the early Christian tradition and the monastic tradition. Um, and we've shared a couple of handouts with you, both a reading list and um, a handout reviewing many of these women. So if you wanna to refer to that as we go along, um, that might be helpful to you. And otherwise I will turn it over to Sister Mary Foreman and again, welcome. Thank you, Anne. And thank you for the lovely invitation to be with you all today. Um, I like to begin with prayer. So we'll take a moment of quiet and then I'm going to read from Wisdom Chapter 7. For wisdom, the artificer of all taught me. For in her is a spirit intelligent, holy, unique, manifold, subtle, agile, clear, unstained, certain, not baneful, loving the good, keen, unhampered, beneficent, kindly, firm, secure, tranquil, all powerful, all seeing, and pervading all spirits, though they be intelligent, pure, and very subtle. For wisdom is mobile. 
all things by reason of her purity. For she is an aura of the might of God and a pure effusion of the glory of the Almighty. Therefore, not that is sullied enters into her, for she is the refulgence of eternal light, the spotless mirror of the power of God, the image of divine goodness. And she who is one can do all things and renews everything while herself perduring. And passing into holy souls from age to age, she produces friends of God and prophets. And so we pray, O oh, spirit of wisdom, we thank you for this opportunity to be together. And we invite you to unfold that gift of your wisdom in whatever way you design and desire for us. As we listen to the lives of some of these women, and in some cases, they're just little snippets, show us what it is you want us to retain in our hearts and minds and lives about these women and the parallels we might find in our own lives. We trust that you are the spirit who guides this gathering and will speak in and through us. In your loving name we pray, amen. I chose that passage because many years ago when I was a novice, um, Sister Mary Marge was our prioress and one night at our Wednesday Lexio, she read that passage and before she read it, she said, listen for the gift the spirit wants to give you the gift of wisdom. So she read the passage and then we had a time of silence and she read it a second time in silence and then a third time. And after the third time she said, go and live what the spirit said to you and do not speak of what that gift is. Let us see it in your life. And so I've never forgotten that. them lived literally in the desert. For the women of the early church, uh, the word Amma itself means spiritual mother from the Semitic term Emma and the Coptic term Ma'u, M-A-U. The title Amma bestows reverent respect on a wise woman who is recognized as a spiritual guide for others, irrespective of her role as a leader of a community or not. Amas were recognized as what we call pneumatophores, bearers of the spirit of God. These women, through their spiritual direction, their exemplary virtuous lives, and generous bestowal of wealth, either of finances or experience in the ascetical life, served as midwives at Christ's birth in others or called forth reciprocal benefits in those to whom they ministered. So this talk brings together selected early Christian women who were honored for their wisdom and heroic lives. They represent a wide range of literary forms which convey portrayals of their virtuous lives, their deeds and words. No one way of life characterizes an ama. For the women included actual mothers. So we have Perpetua and Monica, the mother of Theodoret and the mother-to-be Felicity, the servant of Perpetua. Then we have wealthy widows, Marcella, Melania the elder, Paula and Olympias. The married woman, Melania the younger and unmarried virgins, Tecla, Indicia, Eustochium and Syncletica, and then reformed prostitutes, Thais and Mary of Egypt, as well as Sarah, an actual desert ama who struggled for years with what she called the demon of fornication. And then there's Marina Marinus, a transvestite virgin. There's also the pilgrim Egeria, who wrote a diary of her visitations to shrines of holy men and women in the Christian East, and then gave witness to the liturgical ceremonies in Jerusalem. 
And then when the manu the sole manuscript we've been able to find, and it doesn't have a beginning, uh, was found in the late 1800s, this diary along with the sermons of Basil, of, excuse me, Cyril of Jerusalem, then came together when um, early church studies were being done after Vatican II and her reflections on what happened in the ceremonies in Jerusalem, liturgical ceremonies, and then these homilies of Cyril formed what was the basis for the RCIA. So I used to love to tell my students, we have a significant woman in the early church that has influenced how we do catechesis in the RCIA in modern days. So we'll begin with the Acts of Paul and Tecla. It's an apocryphal account which circulated as an oral tradition in the second century. In this popular story, Tecla was a young Greek woman who, after she was converted to Christianity upon listening to Paul's preaching, she broke off her engagement, which was not something you ever did easily back then, and followed Paul as a disciple. Her fiance was not uh, enamored of the fact that she did this, and so he got the local um, official to. Um, uh, condemn her as a Christian. And so the early part of the, the ACTA talk about the many persecutions that she underwent uh, and she escaped death a few times. Thereafter, she retired to Seleucia to live a life of prayer and solitude. And this story was so well known in North Africa by the beginning of the third century that it was being used to validate the active role of women in Christian ministries like baptism and preaching the gospel. And just today I heard that the German Bishop of Essen has uh, given the faculty to 17 uh, leading women in his diocese to do baptisms. I just saw that today. Anyway, Tecla served as an inspiring example of Christian discipleship to several important female ascetical leaders of the fourth century, or at least to the male writers who spoke of these women as a kind of second Tecla. So for example, in his life of his sister Macrina, Gregory of Nyssa wrote that Macrina's secret name was Tecla. The legendary saint had appeared in a dream to her mother, Amelia, as she was about to give birth to Macrina in order to foretell the life of the child and to point out by the identity of the name, a similarity in their choice of life to be virgins. Melania the elder was lauded by Jerome early in their acquaintance as a Tecla in words recorded by their mutual friend, Rufinus of Aquileia. Uh, Jerome and Rufinus probably went to rhetorical school together, equivalent to college. Quote, Melania was the granddaughter of the council Marcellinus, and in these very chronicles that Jerome wrote, he narrated how the name of Tecla was given her on account of her signal merit and virtue, end quote. Still another author who wrote the fifth century life of Syncletica drew upon the Tecla imagery to highlight the virtues of his protagonist. Quote, the acts of witness of the blessed Tecla are known to all, how through fire and wild beasts she struggled valiantly. And I do not think that Syncletica's virtuous sufferings and exertions go unnoticed by the crowd. But if one savior was the object of their longing, then necessarily one enemy was also their adversary. And I fancy Tecla's sufferings were milder for the evil of the enemy was diminished since he attacked her from without. But in Syncleticus case, he demonstrates his more piercing brand of evil by disturbing her from within through her own contrary and destructive thoughts, end quote. Finally, the fourth century pilgrim Egeria recorded her visit to the site in Seleucia where Tecla was believed to be buried. 
and she read the entire acts of Tekla as she prayed at this shrine. However much the acts of Tekla are considered by some modern scholars as apocryphal fable, the writers of the early centuries of Christianity are more credulous in their borrowing of this story of faith, courage, and exemplary discipleship. Their purpose was to honor the memory and wise following of the prototype of the early Tekla now made manifest in these later exemplars. In this sense, Tekla was a model ama for emulation and imitation. Now I'm going to move to the acts of Perpetua and Felicity if they have a few remarks. In the early third century, both Christian men and women suffered martyrdom for their faith, and both were equally venerated for the sacrifice of their lives in close imitation of their Lord. And they were considered saints because they imitated Christ's own death. And so on the anniversary of their death date, um, they would gather at the site of where they were buried and have a celebration. And then someone would tell the story of them. So much like eventually these were, would all be compiled together so that we have saints lives, but this was kind of the first practice um, in the third century. The acts of perpetual and felicity represented a firsthand account of martyrdom under Septimius Severus, uh, the took place between 202 and 203 as recorded in Perpetua's prison diary, which are chapters three to 10 of that uh, octa. The description of his vision by Satyrus the priest in chapters 11 to 13, an introduction and a conclusion by the redactor or editor, along with an eyewitness narration of the actual martyrdom, chapters one to two and 14 to 21. Vibia Perpetua was a wealthy Christian whose slave Felicity with eight, was eight months pregnant at the time of their arrest. They, Saturus, their Christian instructor, and three other catechumens, Revocatus, Saturninus, and Secundulus, were imprisoned and ultimately martyred for being Christian. While in prison, Perpetua received a series of visions that prepared her to face her ultimate death. One of her acute sufferings was her inability to relieve her father's distress, who was still a pagan, over her imprisonment. The other pre-martyrdom trial was her fears on behalf of her little son, who was for a short time housed with her in the prison but eventually she gave him over to his grandfather's care. As Alma in the group, Perpetua spoke up on behalf of her fellow prisoners by protesting their ill treatment by the jailers. Augustine, Bishop of Hippo, would draw on Perpetua's vision account as an argument for his view of praying for souls after death. Perpetua had had a dream that her deceased brother, Dinocrates, was suffering in the afterlife. And he was pictured in her dream with all these sores on him. And he was trying to reach into a fountain to get a, a drink, but he was really, really thirsty and he couldn't reach the fountain. So she knew when she woke up from the dream that she had to begin to pray for him. And then a few nights later, she had another dream and there he was, totally healed and drinking from the fountain. Herein, her wise listening to her dreams proved beneficial beyond the grave. As well, her action would serve to inspire beginning ecclesial reflection on what would later become the teaching of the souls in purgatory in the 13th century. So, Sometimes my study of these women, I would look for, okay, what happened in later centuries such that there was this practice this woman did at this particular time? A sure precious story. Um, when I shared the story of the acts of perpetual and felicity um, in one of the parishes downtown, it was an adult education class. Um, at the break, one of the moms came to me and she said, 
Sister Mary, I have to tell you something. I had an experience like Perpetua had, and I said, oh, what was that? And she said, well, you know, my daughter was killed in an accident and she was only in high school and she was doing something she wasn't supposed to be doing. And I just was so afraid for her soul. So she said, I kept praying and praying and praying for her. And she said, then one night I had a dream and she came to me in the dream and she said to me, mom, one more rosary and I will be fine. And I thanked her profusely for sharing that story. And yes, she had a perpetual experience. Uh, one other story I'll share and then I'll give you a chance to pick the ones you wanna hear more about. Sarah is one of the actual three one of three amas whose apothegms are part of the wise sayings of the Desert Fathers in the alphabetical collection. So Sarah, Theodora, and Syncletica. In a saying attributed to Abu Pafnudia, she sent someone to ask if he was really doing the work of God by letting his brother be despised. His enigmatic reply was, Pafnudius is here with the intention of doing the work of God and he has nothing to do with anyone else. It might be possible that this Paphnutius is the same monk who is instrumental in the life of Thais, and we'll hear that if you want later on. Sarah was known to have struggled with a passion of lust for 13 years, through which she relied on God's strength. Two of her famous sayings reveal a wordplay on the gender distinction of virtue and manliness, so common in fourth century writings. In response to two monks who set out to humiliate her, she replied, according to nature, I am a woman, but not according to my thoughts. Another time she addressed two brothers, it is I who am a man, you who are women. This reference to her natural condition as woman, but being a man in spirit or virtue, is reflective of the idiom of the day. In the languages of Greek and Latin in the ancient world, there was a close association between virtue, the Latin word virtus, and in Greek, Andrea, and being male, Latin vir, and Greek, andros, such that the property of virtue pertained to being like a man. When early Christian women are complimented on their virtue by male writers, they often term them manly or described as surpassing their gender or nature. As Gillian Cloak, a scholar has noted, quote, feminine spirituality as a concept had no currency in the eyes of the patristic writers of the period. This being so, anyone holy enough to be an exemplar of faith could not be a woman. Every one of the many who achieved fame through piety was held to surpass her sex, never be it noted to elevate the expectations that might be held of her sex, end quote. This way of viewing women of virtue can be quite disconcerting if not repugnant to modern readers with different expectations of what comprises sanctity in our own age, irrespective of gender. Susanna Elm, another scholar, interprets this type of story as an indication of open opposition to Sarah's presence in the desert, an opposition she encounters with that witty double entendre that she is by nature a woman, but in her thoughts, not so. Okay, I'm gonna stop there and let you look over the list and let me know which other ones you know, wanna know something about. And if you want to put like put in the chat if there was someone off the list that you wanted to hear, that's how Anne and I were going to try to to guide Sister Mary.
I just, some people you need just, to see the list again. Let me see if I can pull it up. So Noreen is asking for more on Perpetua. Okay. Uh, Do you want to read the rest, Dan? Uh, Monica. I was going to ask about Monica, too, because I think so often we hear well, that was Augustine's mother who kind of followed him around, <laughs> um, but not so much about really who she was. Mm -hmm. um, and then Olympias, and then more about Syncletica. St. Mary of um, Egypt. You probably heard a lot about her from Mary. A little bit. We, okay. We, yeah, we we're, want to hear more because we, we had a little bit of a time crunch. Okay. All right. So um, with Perpetua, um, her uh, slave woman or servant woman uh, actually gave birth uh, a few months early. Uh, she was afraid that if she, that she wouldn't be able to go into the arena and suffer like the rest of the, her Christian companions, but she gave birth early and then the child was given over to a Christian family to raise. And she just rejoiced that then she could join her companions in, in their persecution and in their dying for Christ. Um, Perpetua's uh, description of her time while she was in prison is one of the earliest accounts that we know that a woman actually wrote. Um, very unusual because uh, most writing was done by men. And if women did do writing, their things weren't saved. Perhaps it's because she was a martyr and that this was incorporated into an Octa account with other martyr stories. Satoris uh, told his side of things, someone who was an eyewitness to their actually being um, mauled by lions. Uh, the fact that all of these were pieced together and then edited and then handed down verbally and then eventually written down is why we actually have her account. Okay, uh, the next one someone wanted to know about was Thais, is that right? Correct. Okay. She was a reformed prostitute of Alexandria, a wealthy and beautiful woman to whom the Egyptian monk Paphnutius came one day in disguise. And he came to warn her about the future judgment of God. And she was so struck by his preaching that she took all the goods that she had accumulated from the visiting of her male companions and she burned them all and then followed Paphnutius into the desert where he enclosed her in a tiny cell, ordering her to pray one prayer repeatedly. Um, Jesus, son of God, have mercy on me. Oops. A sinner. Three years later, he decided to consult the great Anthony of the desert about her. And Anthony's disciple, Paul, received a dream that revealed that Thais had been totally forgiven of her past life. Given that Paphnutius and Anthony figure in this story, it's likely circulated in the mid fourth century. This kind of hagiographical tale was representative of a kind of literature often shared orally among monks who, subject to the temptation to consider themselves holy, because they had overcome temptations by the grace of God, were confronted with the paradoxical holiness of a repentant prostitute. In this particular story, Paphnutius is blunt speaking out of concern for sin, yet his seemingly harsh treatment of the sinner was turned into a revelation of God's gift of forgiveness. Thais lived only 15 more days after her release from confinement. And you have, when you read these stories, you have to know what the symbolic references are. And 15 
represents the 15 Psalms of Ascent. So whether it was actually 15 days or the 15 recitations of those Psalms, her soul is gradually ascending to her creator. Her cell was where she experienced the truth of herself and God's profound mercy. While the story does not say so, one would hope that Paphnutius experienced the joy of the angels who rejoice over one repentant sinner than over 99 who have no need of repentance from Luke 15, 7. Okay, someone wanted Monica, mother of Augustine. famous Bishop of Hippo. She is mostly known to us through her son's reflections on her and his confessions, which were completed in 397 after he was Bishop of Hippo. According to the historian Peter Brown, the confessions reveal that Augustine's inner life is dominated by his mother. By means of this spiritual autobiography, Brown believes readers glimpse in Monica a complex personality. Quote, occasionally we glimpse a genuinely oppressive woman, restrained, dignified, above gossip, a firm peacemaker among her acquaintances, capable like her son of effective sarcasm. Above all, she was a woman of deep inner resources. Her certainties were unnerving. The dreams by which she foresaw the course of her son's life were impressive, and she was confident that she could tell instinctively which of these dreams were authentic, end quote. In the midst of nine years of praying for her son's conversion to Christianity, Monica received a dream that is told in Conference Book 3, Chapter 11, in which she saw herself standing on a wooden rule with a young man who was walking towards her, smiling and joyful. After his inquiry about the reason for her grief, she was told to look again at where she stood, and then she saw her son standing with her. Thereafter, she clung to the belief in Augustine's conversion through nine more years of prayerful solitude, solicitude on his behalf. One of the highest compliments that Augustine paid to his mother was for her contribution to what he called true philosophy, which is how he would have understand the Christian faith. Uh, he himself had gone to rhetorical school, was very gifted in Latin philosophy. At the time he was a catechumen, he and his friend Olypius and Monica lived together at Cassiacum. Augustine in Confessions Book 9, Chapter 4, described his mother as dressed, quote, in a woman's garb, but with a man's faith, clinging to us with an aged woman's sure trust, a mother's love, and Christian devotion, end quote. And notice again, she's manly when she's virtuous <laughs> in the idiom of the time. In the course of a series of discussions recorded in De Beata Vita, that is the blessed life, Augustine and his friends were pleasantly surprised at Monica's understanding of happiness. Quote, if he wishes and possesses good things, he is happy. If he desires evil things, no matter if he possesses them, he is wretched, end quote. And Augustine responded, mother, you have really gained the mastery of the stronghold of philosophy. Another time he exclaimed of her that she shared her insights in such a way that we, Augustine and his companions, entirely forgetting her sex, thought we had some great man in our midst. While in the meantime, I became fully aware whence and from what divine source this flowed, end quote. Thus, Monica was acknowledged by a close male relative for being manly in understanding because their philosophy was grounded in a Christian understanding of the scriptures, not in pagan rhetorical education. Monica served as an ama to her son, not only by virtue of her womanly role as mother, but also according to his perception, 
because she had the manly understanding of truth whereby she became his teacher in Christian philosophy. Now, another intriguing thing about her is when they were um, living near Milan um, and uh, Ambrose was the bishop who was guiding Augustine and Lepius uh, as they were catechumens, mainly because the mom had listened to um, uh, preaching that Ambrose had done in the cathedral. And she finally persuaded Augustine and Olypius to go and listen to this man. And so um, it, they were just flabbergasted at the wisdom that was coming out of this bishop's mouth and so undertook to become catechumens. Um, the other thing Augustine noted about Ambrose is that he often read the scriptures without reading them aloud. He would uh, walk by the room in which he was, and he was just mouthing the words, but in silence, whereas the common custom of the time was to read the scriptures out loud. So you heard the word from your own ears as your mouth spoke them and you held the book. Uh, that was the process of reading the scriptures. Another interesting story about her is that he had a common law wife when he was in North Africa because according to the Roman culture of the time, he was not allowed to marry her because she was of a lower uh, caste system than he. He was not an aristocrat but he did belong to a higher middle class because his father was some kind of uh, official in the government of Tagast. Well, um, eventually they had a child. Uh, and then when Augustine left for Italy, he left her behind, but he took the son with him, a Deodatus. And a Deodatus name means a gift given by God. And then uh, when they were living in Castiacum and a Deodatus was part of the retinue as they were studying scriptures and that, Augustine's mother got the thought that he really ought to be married to someone of his own social class. So she found a young woman who uh, she started the arrangements for this marriage to take place, but Augustine said, no, he could not do that. <laughs> Uh, while he had struggled with um, his own libido, he was not willing to marry because he was hearing a call to be given over to God. So she was very influential sometimes with him and other times not. Now I have a story to share about Monica and my family. I have three sisters and as each one was born, my mother who is a Polish Catholic wanted to name us Monica because she had married my father who was a Mormon. And she kept praying that to St. Monica that my dad would receive the gift of the Catholic faith if that's what God wanted for him. So every time one of us was born, she wanted to name us Monica. My dad would say, you really have a thing about that name. And my mom said, yes, I do. <laughs> but she didn't tell him what she was doing. So <laughs> eventually, Monica came along and my mom said to my dad, now she could have your same initials. My dad's name was Major Neil Foreman and Major was his first name. It wasn't a category uh, in the armed services. She said, and she could have your same initials so you can pick the middle initial N. He thought about it and he said, let's name her Nell after my favorite horse. <laughs> so, she was named Monica Nell Foreman. <laughs> and I'm not making it up. You had to know my father. Okay, Olympias was another one I heard you wanted to hear about. Okay, I got to find her. She was a contemporary of Paula the companion of Jerome and also a contemporary of Melania the elder, but she never knew any of these women personally. She may have heard about them from letters that may have been exchanged um, 
with their male mentors, but she herself did not know them. She lived about 365 to about 410. After a brief marriage to Nebridius, the prefect of Constantinople, she was left a wealthy young widow. She maintained close friendships with three successive bishops of Constantinople. Gregory of Nazianzen, who was best friends with Basil of Caesarea, Nectarius, and John Chrysostom. Both Nectarius and Chrysostom were recipients of Olympias's bountiful generosity because she and uh, Nebridius never had children, she could inherit his wealth. And she used it um, to uh, benefit the poor in the city of Constantinople to help the clergy and also establish monasteries in the city. Um, ne Nectarius ordained her a deaconess, even though at less than 30 years of age, she was quite young for the position. And the early church at that time felt that since someone 30 years of age was still eligible to be married and have children, it wasn't an idea to ordain her a deaconess, but she ought to be more like 60 where there's no uh, question of um, bearing children. But um, Nectarius chose otherwise. Under Nectarius' successor, John Chrysostom, she built a monastic dwelling near the Constantinople Cathedral, and that housed over 250 women. So she must have had a profound influence, uh, both in her personality and in her um, goodness of life, that she attracted that many women um, to live um, the virginal life. When John Chrysostom was in exile from his bishopric in 404, he wrote several letters to his friend Olympias, of which 17 have survived. In these letters, one observes the giving of consolation on the part of John towards Olympias, who was grieving over his sufferings and the fact that he was so far away from home. He easily expressed his joy in knowing that she had recovered from an illness. He praised her for the power of her philosophical soul, the wisdom of her art, and for having gained perception by experience, all qualities one would expect in a spiritual mentor that is in an Abba, Amma. Okay, was there uh, others? Yes, um, both uh, Mary of Egypt and Adika. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mary of Egypt. I'm trying to find the book. Oh. Thais and Mary of Egypt are both to be found in this book called Harlots of the Desert, uh, translated by uh, Benedicta Ward, uh, a nun of England. So. <clears throat> She was a famous prostitute turned penitent whose story circulated widely in the sixth century. When Zosima, a monk of Palestine, had grown to holiness of life as a child from the time he was weaned as a child, in his midlife he began to experience a tormenting thought that he was so perfect he didn't need to be taught by anybody. God help you if you ever have that thought. That's 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 a form of arrogance. An angel came to tell him that a great ordeal awaited him and that he had yet to learn the varied ways to salvation. So he left his home monastery for one shown to him by the angel where he was welcomed by the Abba there. Every Lent, he noticed the monks there had a practice to go out into the solitude of the desert and return for Holy Thursday but to keep secret whatever practices they conducted during their fast. Zosima on that first um, 
going out into the desert, encountered a phantasm. He didn't know it was a woman, but the phantasm called him by name, Zosima, and asked him for a blessing. He, the priest, asked her for a blessing. Quote, O oh, mother in the spirit, it is plain that from this insight that all your life you have dwelt with God and have nearly died to the world. It is plain above all that grace is given you since you called me by my name and recognized me as a priest, although you've never seen me before. But since grace is recognized not by office, but by gifts of the spirit, bless me for God's sake and pray for me out of the kindness of your heart. So the woman gave way to the wish of the old man, end quote. That the priest asked a woman for a blessing reversed the normal cultural expectation. After an initial reluctance, she responds by praying for both of them. And throughout the rest of the story, she ministered to Zosima's need for deeper salvation by confessing her past life as a prostitute and the years of repentance in the solitude of the desert. Part of that story of her own conversion is that uh, she left Alexandria where she had been raised and boarded a ship and then sold her wares along the way for her, uh, the cost of going on the ship. And then they, the ship was actually uh, full of pilgrims going to the Holy Land. And when she gets to the Holy Land, she tries to follow the pilgrims into this church and there was a force that kept her out. She tried two more times and couldn't get into the church. And then she sees that there was an icon of Mary on the si side of the church before the entrance door of the Blessed Virgin. And she knew who she was. So she prayed to the Blessed Virgin that she would be allowed to enter into this church. And she was, she went into the church and then eventually um, was told to spend the rest of her life in penitence for the way that she had lived her life previous to this. And so that's when she went out into the desert with just a few kernels of three loaves of bread. Now, again, the three loaves of bread call to mind Jesus breaking the loaves for the, the crowd, you know? Um, Zosima returns, uh, asks if he will see her again the next year, and she invites him to please um, bring her the Eucharist because she hasn't partaken of Eucharist for 17 years. So um, he does. The following year, he goes out into the desert. He wanders around a lot because he can't see where she is. But then he looks in the distance and here she is walking across the water to him, just as Jesus walked across the water. Again, another symbolic image that she has become a Christ figure for him. Matter of fact, the notion of walking on water is actually an idiomatic expression starting in the book of Job and also found in one of the Psalms that I can't recall off the top of my head, for an experience of the transcendent God. So not literally walking on water, okay? But pay attention, an epiphany is about to happen. So he gives her communion, and then once again, she says, come and see me next year. Well, the following year, he does. He goes out there, and uh, he can't find her anywhere. He looks and looks and looks. And um, finally, he sees her body stretched out on the desert. And the, written in the sand is the words, bury Mary here. Well, he hasn't got anything to um, move the sand in order to dig it deep enough to have a burial place for her. And he starts to weep. Well, a lion comes up. And he's pretty terrified but he waits to see what the lion will do and it licks her.
Now, throughout this hagiographical story are all kinds of images in which Mary reflects the Christ figure. The lion is a Christ figure in scripture and it licks her feet just as the woman who washed Jesus's feet in the Lucan account uh, or in that John 13 account of Jesus washing the feet of the disciples. She had so profoundly uh, repented that she's recognized as an icon of Christ when seen through the eyes of faith. In the Orthodox tradition, on the second, I think it's the second Sunday of Lent, her life is read as one of the readings at Eucharist because she is such an important saint in the Orthodox tradition. Okay, Syncletica. She was the uh, superior of a monastery of women in Alexandria. She didn't have a mother to encourage her vocation to virginity. Rather, she rejected her parents' efforts to marry her as a beautiful young girl. And she decided to devote herself to the practice of virginity at first in their household. Then when her parents died, she disposed of much of the wealth uh, and property of the family. And she went to go live in the tombs located outside of Alexandria. This is something that Antony also did. And in the tombs, there were places where people were buried and to go live in the tombs was kind of a, a spiritual death, so to speak. Um, and a way of fasting and prayer and dying to your life in the world. The Desert Fathers the other two being Sarah, whom we've talked about, and Theodora. The 27 sayings of hers circulated separately from this vita or life, which was written early in the fifth century. The main body of this life was comprised of the teaching of this wise virgin to a community of women disciples who gathered around her like an assembly, a sincletos. The very little that's known about her was told in the opening chapters 1 to 21 and the closing ones on her last illness and death, 104 to 113, and all the chapters in between are her teaching, much of which is based on her having probably studied and known the writings of the monk Evagris and his uh, system of the logismoi or the passionate thoughts or what we would call the capital sins. But she formulated this teaching in a unique parabolic style which utilized images from ordinary life around her. Women washing clothes or cleaning house or steering a ship because Alexandria was a port on the Mediterranean and she would have seen ships there all the time. At the beginning of her discourse, she reminded the women who pressed her to teach them, quote, we have a common teacher, the Lord. We draw spiritual water from the same well and we suck our milk from the same breasts, the Old and the New Testaments. This imagery is one she may have learned from, uh, now I'm trying to think of his name, um, before Origen. Oh dear, he was a teacher at Alexandria. Sorry. Her response indicates the basis for all her wisdom, the pondering on the biblical word long enough that it provoked nourishment for living the Christian life. Her example of being silent before speaking 
was what characterized all Amas and Abbas who were reticent to speak unless moved by the spirit. The women waited to receive her words, quote, like babes at the breast. There are two works. You can actually read the life of Blessed Syncletica. Whiff and Stock is the, uh, took over the copyright of the Blessed Life of Syncletica. You can just Google it. And uh, then Mary Schaefer's uh, master's thesis was uh, part two, a study of the life. And I always love to point out to people that Mary studied and did Lexio on this work for a few years and came up with this diagram. The pearl of great price is incredibly important uh, in the life and teaching of Syncletica. We have the chapters of her exterior life, her birth and then her dying. Uh, there's an epilogue, well, a prologue and an epilogue, and then the chapters about her life, that second ring. And then in the middle, the first half of the book talks about how do you deal with these logismoi, and the second half takes it up again with remedies, all interspersed with, with very um, graphic sometimes stories. Okay, one of the ones that stays with me, and I'm, I'm not calling this totally from reading it, it's from memory, but she talks about when you're starting to clean a house, you notice where the dust bunnies are. But also when you start shaving the hair off the head, you know where the lice are. <laughs> so that those are her images for sin and failings. Now, granted, we might not use those kinds of images ourselves, but you can't forget what she teaches when you see it or visualize it, okay? I, I'm going to add, I mean, um, thank you for those book recommendations. I'm gonna add in chat your book on praying with the desert mothers, which I love. I just love that. If you want a, just a, um, a, a read, right, that you can really sit with to uh, read about many of the desert mothers. And what I appreciated, Mary, so much about that book was your questions are, are so insightful. I think they're some of the best discussion questions, reflection questions I've ever seen. They really just kind of draw you in and um, lead, really lead you to a deeper place. So um, again, I just really recommend that, that volume to people. So I, other questions that have come up, um, someone asked about phantasm and that raises for me also this, um, you mentioned a lot about dreams and fantasies and images and so on. And it's so interesting that the what we know about these these women and these early writings in Christianity that they're so reliant and they trust dreams and fantasies. Is there anything more you could say about that? Well, you know, the biblical precedent is, you know, Joseph never spoke directly with God, but an angel always revealed something to him in a dream. <laughs> you know, take Mary as your wife take them to Egypt, then leave Egypt, and so on and so forth. And then you've got that famous dream that Jacob had, <laughs> seeing the angels ascend and descend. Um, so dreams, for many of them, were a way of communicating with the spirits or with the spirit. And um, I know from an Egyptian friend of mine that I was in graduate school with, that one of the customs in her family, she came from a Coptic Christian family, was the children would tell the mother and father their dreams. Mm -hmm. And so in the breaking open of the dreams, they had a sense of what the images in the dreams might mean, given whatever they had been experiencing. And then there are some dreams that just really stay with you. 
pneumatic dreams that tell you you must do whatever it is that's being asked of you. Now, growing up, I had a mother like that. If she dreamt it, it happened. Now, sometimes she would wake up and say, oh, I had a dream of dread. And we would always just go, uh-oh. <laughs> one of those was um, one night I was, uh, well, I'd been in college and I was on a hayride and the engine of the truck caught fire and we all had to jump off the hay wagon because we didn't know if there was going to be an explosion and then we all ended up in the emergency room because we had various injuries of one kind or another. The next morning I get a phone call and my mom said okay what hospital were you in? <laughs> <laughs> She had a dream and she saw the accident. Wow. We could never get away with much in my family because my mother would have a dream. <laughs> <laughs> kind of scary, but <laughs> so um, for some people, this is a real experience or a way of knowing. So you know how to pray for somebody that's important in your life. Okay. Now, phantasms are probably imaginations, imaginings that take place. Um, and I often think that when um, Anthony was in the cave all those years, and he had these vivid pictures of the Egyptian gods painted on the walls in that tomb, that it's no wonder he began to hallucinate. <laughs> and as if those particular images came alive for him. Mm -hmm. And so we had to struggle with those images and interpretations of him, of those images that would not lead him to God. So they served a purpose. That's a little bit of what helps to explain what's going on here. Yeah, thank you for that. You're welcome. Um, and let me get, I have to see who, oh, Anne-Marie Peters um, mentioned the image in your prayer. And I love this too, of midwives at the birth of Christ and others. Mm -hmm. um, so Anne-Marie Peters is asking maybe to talk a little bit more about if, is, you know, she, she frames it as, as women or preachers or other roles of outreach. As, a point, as opposed to more of an isolation. Um, and, and maybe just sort of adding, you know, how, how women in the church can be lifted up in a way that they're recognized as, as these midwives of the birth of Christ and others. Well, one of the women that I really love, and we didn't get a chance to talk about her yet, is Marcella. She, um, when she uh, received the gift to be a Christian, she was very intelligent. Um, and when she had already started a community of women reading the Bible in Greek and in Hebrew, and Latin would have been her native language. So she was already surfacing, she would be comparing the Greek and the Hebrew and raising questions. So when Jerome came to Rome, um, after she'd been, had her uh, catechetical house, if you will, on the Aventine, she would ask him to respond to questions she had. And then um, sometimes she would write him a letter and say, what about this and what about that? Now, unfortunately, we have none of her letters, but we do have Jerome's responses to her letters, <laughs> which says she asked very pointed questions. Um, and he was sometimes so, um, and she would compare the Hebrew, what does it mean in the Hebrew, such and such was said. So he would respond to her. <laughs> and then she would communicate that to the other virgins and the widows who lived in her household with her. Mm -hmm. Then when Jerome and Paula, and Paula had lived in her household with her daughter Eustosium for a period of time until she got her own place in Rome. Um, and Paula and Jerome and Eustosium moved to Bethlehem, people would come to Marcella and ask her what certain scripture passages meant. 
So she became a significant teacher in the city of Rome on how to interpret scripture that would bring forth people to live their life more fully. Now, there are all kinds of scripture circles I know in different parishes, most of which have been started by women. And so reading the scriptures ourselves, we learn something about how the scripture can speak to us. And in a community, it's not just one person's interpretation that is taken as gospel, huh? but it's enriched by the sharing of the community around that word. And granted, you can read commentaries, you know, so that we don't get too far afield. But um, I think another thing that's helpful for women in our day and age is why not ask some of the, I wouldn't ask priests if they don't have a strong biblical background, but why not ask some of the scripture scholars at the colleges near where you are, what does this mean? <laughs> Um, when I was a, a student in undergrad at Idaho State University, we had a Newman Center and our chaplain was very, very well educated. And I would often go to him and I say, well, at mass, I heard such and such. What does that mean? <laughs> Which usually meant a half hour discussion. But I just learned to do that. Mm -hmm. But of course, I had a mother who, when the priest would preach, on Sunday, he came over to our house and she would say, you know, when you talked about this in your homily, I don't believe it. <laughs> <laughs> this would be the dinner table conversation. <laughs> so, Maria, if I had naturally. <laughs> yeah. Yes. So if if um, we only have a few minutes, and if I could... Mm -hmm you a question that we've asked, we asked many of our presenters in this series. What, what holds you in our church? What, what keeps you here? The fact that I belong to a Benedictine community of women. Um, that's the primary thing. The other thing is the grace of God. And um, one of the things when I recently as prioress, um, I decided that the issues of our um, canticle, which is a tri, three times a year, triennial publication, I would introduce people to these women. So each time I do a canticle, I tell a story of these women as a way of encouraging women to pursue the gift of wisdom that's within them. And, um, Many women, and actually one man, Terence Cardung, encouraged me to do further studies. And then when I got to St. John's, I noticed there weren't too many classes on desert women nor on the medieval monastic women. So I said, I would like to teach them. Well, I got told there isn't much literature out there. So I went, I got my list, I went back in and I said, here's the literature. And so I started the classes on the women in the church. And a lot of men don't know anything about these women, a lot of priests don't. So for me, it's important as a woman scholar to introduce people to significant women in history. Does that help? It does. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Um, I was. Oh, someone asked, uh, Elio was wondering, did, did your father ever become Catholic? Yeah, he did. Actually, he got up one Sunday. He, he would go to church with us, and he got up one Sunday and went to communion when I was about 10. And I'm yanking on my mom's coat. He's not supposed to do that. She said, I know. We'll talk to him after church. So we get in the car, and she said, Neil, do you want to tell me something? He said, yeah, I've been taking instructions for the third time, and I was baptized last night, and I wanted to surprise you. <laughs> so she was a character. <laughs> you had very interesting parents, Mary. <laughs> I did, yes. <laughs> there, there would not have been many dull days in the household. <laughs> the no, there weren't. <laughs> 
Well, thank you so much. It's been so delightful. And like I said, it was just such an honor to have you with us. Um, well, it's been my honor to be with you. So. Yeah, and maybe maybe someday we'll, we'll get a chance to meet, especially with our mutual friend, Mary Schaefer. <laughs> right. Okay, well, you have a wonderful rest of the Lent, okay? Thank, thank you. you so much. Thank and you. thanks to 